President Obiang assumed power in 1979. At that point, Equatorial Guinea was one of the poorest countries in Africa and in the world. Equatorial Guinea was coming from 11 disaster, disastrous years of lack of political space, poverty, because President Macias, his, pre his predecessor, has ensured that there was no economy in the country, there were no schools, no education system, there were no hospitals, no health system. Right? So we're coming from a disastrous years, 11 years. For the first few years, with the help of the World Bank, IMF, and mostly Spain, Equatorial Guinea economically began to recover. The economy back then was mostly based on, in addition to foreign assist assistance, uh, timber. Equatorial Guinea is natural, at least the, the continental side, is naturally endowed with a lot of timber and wood. So for a few years, timber was a source of the economy. But in 1994, oil was discovered in Equatorial Guinea. And almost overnight, Equatorial Guinea went from being a very poor and isolated country to becoming the richest country in Africa. And at that point, 1995, 1996, 1997, top three, one of the three richest countries in the world. In 1996, at the height of oil production in Equatorial Guinea, we were ranking second to Luxembourg. Right? And that is again because we have a population of half a million people and we were producing between 450,000 to 500,000 barrels of oil every single day. Politically what that did was, well, with so much more money coming, without the institution, institutions in place to guarantee transparency and accountability without a Congress that could hold government accountable, without civil society that could push for transparency and accountability. What I did immediately you know, is to position the president in a way that he could use all these resources to further ensconce, further entrench his power inside the country. He bought off political opposition, he went outside the country, kidnapped people, and brought them back to the country that he felt were a threat to his power. Regionally, he bought a lot of influence. So you have regional papers, Jeune Afrique and others inside Africa, who began to publish all this good information about this president. Despite the oil discovery, despite the wealth from the oil, the average person in Equatorial Guinea has not benefited from that oil boom. There has been some infrastructure. There are roads, there are better roads from the airport to the city. Um, there is a brand new hospital that is top of the line in Central Africa. But nobody can afford to go to that hospital because it wasn't built with the average Equator Guinean in mind. And the roads, well, if there is a road from the airport to the city, but you don't provide public transportation and other ways for people to be able to make use of these roads, then it becomes just an elephant project, right? Um, we know, for instance, Equatorial Guinea hosted the African summit. In preparation for hosting the African summit, they built a luxury resort, $850 million spent on building a luxury uh, resort to host the African delegates and African diplomats and heads of state they were coming. You go a kilometer away from this resort called Sipopo, and the poverty is outstanding. People living right next to sewer systems, open sewer, people um, living in rat-infested, mosquito-infested houses, people living without 
water without the electricity 365 days a year. So yes, people can see the new buildings, the new roads that exist, the new port, the new airport. That, however, has not changed the average person's life. That has made it possible that those, that 1% of the population that has the resources because they are in the family of the government or because they do have a job with the oil companies, live better, can use these roads, but the average Equatorian has not.